Hello and welcome to Future Talk. India's demographic dividend of millions of fresh graduates entering the workforce every year is failing where it counts the most. These students who graduate from their respective colleges are far from ready to be inducted into the industry. They need to be trained with a host of skills before they can start performing on the job. One solution is skill development. But the skill training is also one of India's biggest failures. Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship says that less than 5% of total workforce in India has ever undergone formal skill training. Industry leaders would tell you they hire from top schools not for skills but for the potential. So how can India make its graduates industry ready? To discuss this, we have a very distinguished panel here with us. John Fallon, the CEO of uh, Pearson Global, the world's largest education company. We have Jayant Krishna, uh, former CEO of NSDC. We have Jeremy Wade, founder director of the Jindal Center for Social on Innovation. And we have Mohan Lakham Raju. He is the founder and CEO of Great Learning, which is a hybrid learning company. Let's start with, uh, with you, John. Uh, one of the biggest issues right now is that, you know, uh, what's being taught in schools and colleges is no longer required uh, by the industry. So, are we, is this really education truly out of sync with, uh, with reality or are we exaggerating it a bit? I, th I think let's just take a step back and I think a lot of the things that is powering this debate as well as the statistics that you just quoted is the rapidly changing nature of the future of work. You know, we read headlines every day about the robots are going to take our jobs and how many different occupations are going to be disrupted by technology, machine learning, artificial intelligence and the like. So we did a big survey a couple of years ago where we looked at what are not just, you know, where is there going to be greater demand for jobs and where are there going to be jobs that are going to be disrupted by technology, but more importantly, what are the underlying skills and knowledge that we're going to need to be successful in this sort of robot world of the future? And guess what the skills that were most in demand were? Uh, the ability to learn how to learn because we're all going to have to reskill, rechange, re relearn new things. Uh, it was fluency of ideas. You know, India increasingly becoming a major centre of innovation in its own right. That happens because of people's ability just to come up with lots of new ideas. The ability to persuade somebody else of a different point of view. The ability to empathise, to listen, to take lots of complicated pieces of information and synthesise them. Those are the skills that actually are the things that make us innately human and which are hardest for robots to replicate. <clears throat> and guess what? The institution in the world, here in India and every other country, that best teaches those skills and capabilities, those underlying platform, if you like, on which more specific skills related jobs can be, uh, roles can be taught, is the university. So there's something going on. Yeah. I think universities are probably need to be more explicit about those underlying skills that they are teaching and enabling and more specifically design them into specific curriculum. Jen, how much out of sync is education with I think, I think we're very, very uh, badly out of sync. You know, I mean, a uh, few years back uh, with the, uh, you know, the erstwhile uh, planning commission before Niti IO came into being. You know, I was involved in a study and to our utter surprise we found that if you look at all uh, the entire pool of graduates and postgraduates in the country, then the employability of these graduates and postgraduates is just about 10%, you know. If you look at the professional courses, you know, the BTECs and MBAs and, you know, that category, uh, it, it was as low as 24%, you know. So I think what really, uh, so what is happening is a huge drain of national resources which is going, to, which, which is producing uh, people who are not employable, I think. So I think it's very, very important to mainstream employability skills, which is very important. And even in a country like uh, India, where the education attainments for a large number of people who go through the primary and secondary education are so poor, you know, you would recall the ACER study, you know, where a class 8 certificate holder couldn't even read a class 3 vernacular uh, textbook, you know, kind of a thing. And mathematical skills were even poorer, you know, kind of a thing. So I think uh, the challenge, but, uh, you know, for higher education and uh, skill development, these two areas is 
that the input that they get, uh, you know, bearing a few exceptions of the creamy layer, uh, is the, the input is so poor that, you know, sometimes I feel, you know, what can these people do? Can I do they become magicians? You know, and then the other issue is uh, uh, ac academia in our country does not engage very well with, with the industry, you know, kind of. There's a huge divide between the two. Yeah. Uh, good people in the industry who have the capability to deliver value uh, in academics, they feel it's a waste of time to engage with them. And, and, and uh, academia, uh, uh, bearing a few exceptions again, uh, does not have the confidence to engage with the industry. And unlike, you know, for example, in Stanford University, where Silicon Valley, uh, actually Silicon Valley thrived to a large extent because of Stanford and a few other universities in, in the Bay Area, you know, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Why can't we uh, make that happen here? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, barring perhaps an Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, or a few IITs, I think this kind of thing, and there also the engagement is much less. I think that's very, very important. The two have to go hand in hand. Otherwise, through a prism of timelessness, we'll keep blaming the industry or the academia and the, never the twain shall come together. Mm -hmm. It's very important for them to work together. Jeremy, you built the institution around this, you know, this, this uh, course or the center of yours. Uh, what's your experience? Is, is it still out of sync? Well, it's certainly out of sync, but it's because we're in the midst of a fourth industrial revolution. Um, in 2018, one million new people got on the internet. So we're seeing rapid change in industry and society. And I think there's no doubt it's out of sync. And there needs to be rapid change and adaption. Um, at, at OP Jindal Global University, it's a university that's nonprofit, private university, 10 years old, has recently gotten the uh, global rankings, the top 800 in the QS rankings. I think one of the reasons has been focusing on quality faculty and giving the faculty the opportunity to innovate and try to to sync up that that disconnect. You know, to try to experiment with things like online learning, experiment with things like uh, experiential learning in the classroom try to get the students to, to problem solve. And I think this kind of experimentation is what's key if we're going to, 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 to meet this pace of change. Mohan, well, your initial thoughts? I mean, how out of sync are we? Yeah, so I think, you know, building on what my uh, fellow panelists have said, uh, we have to recognize the role that academic institutions have to play in this world, right? So right now, there's a whole sort of roles that are kind of being superimposed and expected out of you know the the education system mm -hmm. right so um, I agree with uh, John when he said the skills that actually are going to matter are the human skills mm -hmm. right so you know and at the same time these are not the skills that are going to get you a job right yeah. so you need a combination of both right? so either the universities have to recognize this and you know, focus on both of these separately. The same people can't do both, mm -hmm. right? The teachers that are helping you learn to collaborate, be empathetic, you know, be, be able to synthesize, problem solve, these are life skills, you know, and the faculty who are closely aligned with industry, who are tracking the developments that are happening and factoring that into their, you know, curricula, you know, rapidly, yeah. these are two very different approaches and the same people can't be expected to do both right and the challenge we have right now is that everything is put in the same bucket right and everything is measured the same way without actually differentiating these nuances right so this is something for example you know we've recognized right so uh, so great learning is completely focused on the latter right we are teaching people the skills they need to apply tomorrow so we work very closely with employers it's very hard for a traditional academic institution to do that because there they are measured on research, you know, faculty just don't have the time to do the research, to teach all the students and then to actually go figure out exactly what the needs of industry are. Okay, so one of the things is uh, about the input and output, working at both ends, you know, how do you ensure, for instance, that uh, the input, the students you're taking in, uh, are the selection process uh, is such that it is more tuned uh, to the to the output to what the output uh, could be uh, are there other initiatives that you can think of John for instance? I think, I think the, I mean just picking up on that last point I think it's really important if what is it something like uh, you know 30 percent I think of young people in India today go on into higher education or one form or another 
if you look at uh, you know most other economies that have gone through, I mean obviously India's growth is much more explosive, we can say with a high degree of certainty that's going to go up to 50, 50 to 60 percent. I would argue that in, to su succeed in the world of the future, uh, every young person is going to need some form of post-secondary education and training but what they don't all need is the idea of a traditional four-year liberal arts degree mm -hmm. but that's sort of what everybody aspires to because that's seen as the sort of premium and everything else is seen as sort of second rate that's wrong mm -hmm. so we need to start to get much more parity of esteem mm -hmm. between different sort of pathways, mm. uh, much more experiential mm. uh, learning. I mean, we have, in our own uh, headquarters in London, we now have host hosted in the building is Pearson College with the own uh, learning. I mean, we have, in our own uh, headquarters in London, we now have host, hosted in the building is Pearson College, with the only FTSE 100 or Fortune 500 company that actually has its own university. And students love to come to it because they're doing a business degree but then the application of market, you know, for example, the culmination of their uh, marketing seminar is to present marketing ideas to Unilever, one of the biggest, uh, you know, marketing organisations in the world. Uh, if they're doing something around creative media, they get to work at the BBC. So, Jeremy uh, and, and Mohan, if you would like to come in here, where is it that uh, the disconnect is between what the industry wants and what the uh, what the institutions want and we had this discussion just before uh, we came on here uh, essentially uh, why is there this disconnect See, I think ultimately it all comes down to numbers right so the the good and, and what gets measured right it's only what gets measured that is focused on is improved right and the, the top institutions in the country have no shortage of students to come in mm -hmm. right there's so much demand for the top institutions they get the good students Right? And these good students end up, because they are good, they end up getting good jobs. Right? The, the institution really doesn't need to do a whole lot for that. Mm -hmm. right? So the top institutions, that's generally the case. Um, and therefore, employability per se is not measured there because it happens. Mm -hmm. right? And the institutions that are not the top institutions, right? so there the challenge is different. Right? There they are struggling to get students. Right, so a lot of their focus on is in how to get the good students and that's what is measured because there's a lot of focus on that. Jeremy, if you'd, if you'd also like to... Yeah. Uh, I think we have a real opportunity to improve and update curriculum now. If you think about students, they're going to be much more digitally savvy now coming out every year. So we have an opportunity to really build in digital learning just straight from the beginning and I think that can also help to scale up good quality online learning so those really uh, persuasive high quality uh, teachers their content can go wider to more people and I think it also can be developed faster um, and iterated faster and uh, kind of a, um, a way to make sure that it continues to be synced. I completely agree with Jeremy in fact that's exactly you know what uh, we are doing at, at Great Learning and if I may point out the national education policy the draft policy that has been put out there I think it's going through the yeah. you know so, so that's a very progressive policy and it actually draws the distinction between research focused universities teaching focused universities so it brings a lot more focus on what the what an institution ought to be doing right and I think that's a step in the right direction then the priorities of different institutions will be very clear and they can actually invest in those priorities and deliver on those priorities. Do okay. you think? I was yeah, say, the yeah. perspective. So far, with this debate, we've focused very much on uh, what does government do, what does yeah. university do, yeah. uh, what do employers do. Yeah. Uh, but actually it's time to stand in the shoes of the learner and yeah. think of it from their perspective. I think what we're seeing now in education is what is happening in every other sector of our society, which is technology is empowering users mm -hmm. to make demands and change the nature of behavior. We've just uh, published a, a major global learner survey. I think it's the first survey that's been done ever which asked learners all over the world a lot of the questions that we're talking about. And they are already 
making their own decisions. So, very interesting. If you look at around the world, uh, Generation Z, yeah. they have a very different view of the role that a university degree is going to play in their life mm -hmm. from uh, the baby boomer generation. Mm -hmm. uh, they recognize it's not going to be sufficient. They know that they're going to have to get some mm -hmm. very job specific skills yeah. with it. And that means they're thinking, well, how much do I actually want to invest in my university degree, recognizing that? And yeah, and also, just to add, uh, uh, see, we as a country, we have to start embracing technology shamelessly in education. You know. mm -hmm. Look at the volumes we have. We have 600,000 villages, you know. We have more, about 600 districts in the country, you know. How would you ever have top grade teachers in, in each of these locations, you know? Yeah. So, you know, unless, unless the best of breed teachers come teach, it is recorded and it is, it is uh, relayed all over the country. Now you have the, you know, the rural uh, broadband availability in about, I think, 200,000 panchayats is going to become a reality very soon, you know, kind of thing. Why not use this bandwidth to, to uh, transmit uh, rich content, you yeah. know? Otherwise, uh, you know, we as a country, we have not incentivized edu teaching to a large extent, you know. So, I mean, uh, barring a few exceptions, again, a uh, lot of unemployable people get into, get into act. Comes this is whole issue that, uh, of the industry, which is about the autonomy. Autonomy, in not just in terms of funding, you know, uh, finding the right teachers, training the right teachers, but also about the curriculum. And uh, also uh, the institutions of eminence, which we are uh, going to start seeing uh, very soon. Can I just pick up, I think this idea of distance learning, because yes. I think this is something where India could learn from what's happening elsewhere in the world, because I do think now, if you look to uh, Europe, if you look to the US, even if you look to China, I think now online learning is recognized to be often at least as good as the campus experience yes. and in many ways superior, yes. certainly if done in a blended and a hybrid way. Yes. I remember talking to somebody some years ago, an open university lecturer, who said, um, let me talk about distance learning. You, you sit in a lecture hall mm -hmm. with 2,000 students mm -hmm. and you try and see the one on the back row. Mm -hmm. That's distance learning. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, I think sort of, you know, uh, Mark Twain uh, described a lecture as the process by which the professor's notes became the student's notes <laughs> without passing through the brains of either of them. <laughs> so uh, I think it's time to completely rethink yeah. these traditional ways of thinking yes. about it. And actually, online learning can yeah. be very very high quality, mm -hmm. it can be very personal, mm -hmm. it can be very adaptive, but we do have to recognize yes. that if there's regulatory barriers that are getting in the way of good quality online education, my advice would be sweep them out of the way as quickly as you possibly can because mm -hmm. the results tell you mm -hmm. that you'll get better quality learning, mm -hmm. more accessible, mm -hmm. more affordable, mm -hmm. and to the point we've been talking about, mm -hmm. much more directly relevant to the world of work. Yeah, so, so Jen, uh, is the industry ready to accept that? Uh, and, and the whole issue, issue of autonomy, uh, curriculum, uh, faculty, funding. You know? See, when it comes to autonomy... Pricing, pricing of your, uh, yeah. your, 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 your major education issue. service. Yes. You know? Yeah, so I think uh, autonomy uh, can't have one absolute definition in a country as diverse as ours. You know? If you look at the IITs, perhaps the RECs, which are uh, uh, you know, NITs now, and uh, top 10 or 15 engineering colleges in the private sector in the country, Perhaps they deserve more uh, autonomy, you know. Yeah. But look at the lower end uh, colleges, you know, yeah. where, where, you know, uh, the pe lot of people who entered into just to make a fast path kind of a thing. Yeah. Do you need autonomy? There is likely to be misused more, you know. There are business schools, IMs, uh, perhaps, you know, another 15, 20, 25 uh, top end colleges. If you leave them aside, rest of the category, you know, I think autonomy could also, uh, uh, could be mis misused, you know. So autonomy is very, very important to people who have brought value on the table, who have delivered word, you know. They need a lot of freedom because unless you give them freedom, they will, they, they will not reach their uh, uh, place that yeah. they're destined to. Yeah. Education in India is a one-way traffic. When you put in money into it, you can't take the money out. So, you, so there is no incentive for many, uh, in many industries to actually invest very heavily uh, in education. It's more like philanthropic activity. If from the panel, if there are uh, any suggestions on what is it that one can do about uh, about this, because this continues to be industry's bugbear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Private universities let I mean, let market uh, forces operate mm -hmm. very clearly. If somebody prices it out of context, yeah. 
I mean, the, the, uh, that university or the institution will be eased out uh, automatically. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see no relevance to control this. Of course, mm -hmm. you just have to guide through a regulator mm -hmm. that it should not be a cartelization of players. Yeah, I mean, I come back to a point on skill development um, that we haven't talked about, I think, is around entrepreneurship, too. Yeah. And I think not just in job creation and, uh, you know, the jobs that entrepreneurs create, but thinking about entrepreneurship more holistically. Being entrepreneurial is a skill, and I think that can go to the, the skills that are needed to keep learning, that can go to moving career to career faster and uh, adapting to the change faster. So I think yeah. uh, the more we can do around entrepreneur right. skill development. Yeah. Actually, I think there is evidence to show that you know when market forces are allowed to work, there have been phenomenal outcomes, right? So yes, there have been bad instances, 20 years back, 15 years back, you know, when information was not as easily available, when the yeah. information asymmetry mm. was very high, right? Mm. Now information is there instantly, mm. right? If somebody does something bad, social media, it's mm. on it immediately, mm. right? So there are market forces that are keeping people in check, mm. right? So, you know, ISB, to, for, for somebody to study there, costs 35 to 40 lakhs, yes. yet it's one of the top institutions in the country, right? right? Why? Because people are getting an ROI, mm. right? And those fees are allowing them to employ the best faculty from the world, mm -hmm. right, and deliver the best quality education, right? So it's so mark, wherever market forces have operated and have been allowed to operate, they've actually led to good outcomes in today's day and age. Before we close, we're running out of time. Uh, if we could have from each of you uh, very quickly two best practices uh, of uh, industry ready. Uh, students. I do believe this power of technology to adapt and personalize yeah. learning the way that uh, artificial intelligence is going to yes. provide much more direct and individual feedback to each and every sure. person is incredibly powerful. You have to mainstream employability skills. You have to uh, uh, you know, uh, take up uh, apprentices apprenticeship very very seriously because uh, as I said unless you soil your hands yeah. uh, it will not happen. I think another is we partnered with FutureLearn, uh, one of the MOOC providers and I think those universities who want to you know partner with a technology company can do can possibly build something more effective than trying to build it on their own. Something about FutureLearn that I think is really amazing is how they how they make it peer-to-peer -peer learning kind of built in digital first learning and I think you know, not trying to build it from scratch, but learn from those who've done it well. So, uh, yeah, one request I would have, you know, for the powers that be is to stop looking at private sector with suspicion, right? And to actually trust that, you know, they know what they're doing, and there's a lot of evidence of that. Second is embracing online completely, mm -hmm. right? I think it's high time we introduce the notion of online degrees, mm -hmm. right? It's already happening in many countries, so we should make online degrees first-class citizens. So that, and that also is, is the biggest challenge uh, uh, in terms of acceptance uh, by the industry and by uh, even those who are getting into the education system. So Nelson Mandela has famously said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And India will lose out as much as dollar $1.97 trillion in gross domestic product growth if the country fails to bridge the skills gap. We have a big challenge and even bigger opportunity. It's up to us to surmount the challenge and grab the opportunity for a better future. With that, I'd like to thank my panelists. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for watching.